Amen. Give Dan a hand. Thank you, guys. You may be seated. There's so many emotions coming through today, so say a quick prayer for your pastor. Um, I want this message to come across clear, bold, but uh, remove all the, uh, the negative emotions. If you're new here, brand new, I'm Pastor Matt. Do not get used to this. I'm usually in shorts and a, shirt, a t-shirt or a button-up shirt. Um, but this is for, for my own personal selfish reasons. Oh, by the way, happy birthday, Macy. I see you over there. Happy birthday. Um, so uh, my wife leaves tomorrow for two weeks. She leaves uh, to go to Washington to care for her grandmother who uh, fell and broke her hip, and she's recovering, so be praying for her. But selfishly, um, I wanted to add a little spice to the marriage before she left. Um, <laughs> have some marital bliss today, if you know what I mean, married people. So um, and when I came down and she's like, whoa, I'm like, okay, it's starting off, with the, starting off good. Uh, this is the, uh, the end of, I'm not saying the end of anxiousness. I, I hope nobody believes that. This is the end of our anxious sermon series. Um, what do you do? Today, I wanna to ask you, what do you do when you're not okay? What do you do when you're not okay? I want you to look through the lens of how if you, a lot of you have grown up in church. I'm not gonna be careful with this sermon because that would be dishonest. I'm gonna be bold with this sermon, okay? Um, the, the end of this sermon series, maybe you came into this thinking, okay, Pastor Matt's gonna give me steps 10 steps in order to remove all this anxiousness in my life. That hasn't happened. But let me tell you what, what has happened is there's the, been so many breakthroughs from people who realize instead of focusing on myself, Pastor Matt, you're asking me to focus on Jesus. That, that's what you're talking about with this um, anxiety, this anxiousness is to focus on Jesus. There, there was a uh, so many texts that we've received of my spirit just feels full. Like I feel like, uh, like the chains are coming off. Like I feel like God cares for me. That is huge for some people. Of, even though this is happening, I just feel like God cares. So many revelations through this. But let me, uh, spoiler, let me share what this sermon series has all been about. It's all been about Jesus and our focus. Our focus on Jesus, not saying that you're going to remove your anxiety, but what to do within that anxiety. And as churches, we sometimes take that. I shouldn't say sometimes. A lot of times we we take that message of don't be anxious and we leave out the the end of that scripture or even what led up to that scripture. And it's not so much of focusing on ourselves and our anxiety, but on him. We've learned about God caring. We've learned about God bringing himself in the midst, in the middle of our anxiety, of finding our we, of our community. I, I've stressed this from the beginning and I will continue to stress this. This is a group project. We cannot do this alone. You cannot do this alone. Of finding your we, of finding the group within you that you can be open and you can be honest, of just being with him. And I want to relieve some anxiety by, by exposing some of God's truth today. I want to shift the focus to him. This this has been transforming for myself and for a lot of people. But I'm going to give like a uh, precursor to this message. Some of you may not like it. I may get emails. I may get some uh, religious folks mad at me. And I, I want to I want to be open and honest with you. You can send those emails to the whites of Texas at gmail.com. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want to. But today I want to I want to dig deep, and before we even get to our scripture, I I, I want to share something with you that's been on my heart for a couple of days. I battled so bad with anxiety this week. I'm going to be open and honest, okay? And the reason was is because I was trying to fit a message in 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 my own 
perspective of saying this would be a great way to end a, a sermon series on anxiousness. And I took the dogs for a walk and I just felt God putting this overwhelming sense of, of this message that's coming up. And I was like, God, that is bold. And, and he's like, I know, I know. And the moment I gave in to that, that anxiousness just was like, and I came inside and, and my wife knew that there, there's something. I mean, she had to grab me and look at me and say, list all the things that are going on in your mind right now. Let's list it out and let's, let's expose it. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. And that's what I needed. But church, I want, to, I want you to know what, what you have as a pastor. If you claim me as a pastor or you call me your pastor, or maybe you're just here right now and saying, I'm just checking this out. I want you to know who I am as a pastor. There's one hill that I'm willing to die on. And that's the hill of Jesus. And I'm, not, I'm not willing to die on arguments over politics, over relationships, over any trivial thing in the light of eternity. But the one hill that I'm willing to die on is the hill of Jesus, who he is and how, listen to me, how we are getting this message out as churches. And let's just talk to, uh, I know we have people watching all over the world. I wanna talk about the, this Western way of doing church. And there are times that I may come across angry against church and religion. I've been told, Matt, Pastor Matt, your life would be a lot easier if you just went with the flow of other pastors. Just go with the flow and your life will be that much easier. I want you to know that I'm not a go with the flow pastor. Jesus Christ saved my life. He rescued me. He came on a rescue mission. He saved my marriage, saved my, my little girl. And it's all about him. But I want to be honest, I am angry. I'm angry at how this pure message of Jesus has been portrayed in churches all over America. How this message is leading others to judgment of non-believers. How verses are used to crush people. And I'm not, I'm not saying this is my message and my message is right. I'm saying this is the message of my Jesus here. But I've been, I've heard these comments. I've been in church for multiple decades and I've never heard the verse explained like that. It always came across as condemning or it, it made me leaving church feeling like I have so much more that I have to do in my life. Let, let me give you a little hint. Church should leave you walking away with a sense, more of a sense of Jesus than yourself. It should leave you walking away being there is hope in the name of Jesus, not man, I am a wreck. I am a mess. I can't do anything right. Everyone is judging me. We use these verses to lead others to feel less about themselves. And we puff others up to believe that we are better than others when we call them on the name of Christ. This is wrong. And when something is wrong, what I will do as your pastor is I will expose it, I will face it, I will take the criticism, whatever may come. But anything that is stopping or hurting this love, this pure love of Jesus needs to be addressed. This is a hill that I will continue to fight on. To share the, the pure message of Jesus in a hateful way or give it a tone that he never had is wrong. I want to ask you a question. What if we believed everything Jesus said? Isn't that wild? What if we believed everything that Jesus said? But I want you to know I'll be the pastors to stand up against this because it is hurting people that I love. We are adding fillers to church. Every time I say fillers, man, beans and chili is a filler apparently in Texas. I didn't know that. But uh, Washington, we have a lot of fillers in our, in our chili. But we're adding fillers to the church that was never intended. We are sharing this message in a way that I believe breaks the heart of God. We are, we are removing love and replacing it with condemnation and judgment. And we are adding traditions, customs, laws, and rules with arrogance and pride. Church, essentially, we are doing the same things that killed Jesus. And you may be turned off or angry at my stance. But I want you to ask yourself why? Why does this offend you? Why does the way that, that this pure message of Jesus needs to get out in every church in the world, why does it offend you that I'm calling it out? Why are you angry? Why? I want you to look at the labels that we have received as Christians. You've heard them. Before you came in this room, you've heard the labels 
put on Christians. And I want you to look at those labels and match it towards the pure message of Jesus and ask deep within yourself, why? Each, each message should lead us to thinking more about Jesus and his love for us than it should. Thinking about how far I have fallen. This, this message I'm sharing to you is personal to me. It, it has hurt a lot of people that I've loved. A lot of per people that I love now and a lot of people that God will put into my life. But the main reason why I'm upset at the way this message is portrayed is because of how, how close they hit to home. There's a reason why I started this anxious sermon series, and it was maybe selfish selfishly. But my wife is very open about the struggles that she has with anxiety, especially being a pastor's wife. And I asked her, man, I'm shaking. Let's go. Um, I'm, uh, I, asked, I asked her if I could share this. So about six years ago, I get a call that um, she was parked on the side of I-80, six lane freeway in, in Sacramento. And the car was unable to move. And I said, what's wrong with the car? She said, Matt, I can't lift my foot to put my foot on the gas to make it move. I have so much anxiety right now. And you know what my response was? Just do it. Just lift up your leg, put your foot on the gas and go. She said, Matt, I can't. I can't. So we went and we, we brought her home. And for months, I would sit by, a, by my bed, holding my wife as she was crying, saying, I can't get over this anxiety. I can't. I'm weak. I'm not strong enough. I'm not okay. I can't do this. And you know what some people did? They took the verses of this and they used it to crush our family. You're a pastor's wife. You can't have anxiety. You're a Christian. It says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything as I'm holding my wife and she's saying, I just can't beat this. There's nothing within me that, that can overcome this. And so we take these, we take these verses out of context and throw them at people thinking, that's what Jesus asked of us. So yes, I'm upset. I'm upset with those who push people away from church and away from Jesus and not into his arms. It was through a growing relationship that we were able to fight it. And this, this woman right here is my hero because she was able to say, Jesus, just walk with me. Teach, just, I want to get to know you. And it was through that, not the condemnation, not, not the hurt and the verses thrown at us, but it was the pure love of Jesus that I saw improvement in my family. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some things today that may challenge the church norm. I, I hope you're okay with that. And at any time, I, I will not be mad if anyone has to leave. But we, we aren't here to play church. I didn't uproot my entire family and move to an island that we knew nothing about to pretend when it came to church. We came here on a rescue mission that we had no idea why God wanted us here. But I see the, the people, the individual people that God has put in our life. We see now why this has happened. And I pray that you know the only reason I'm doing this is to throw us deeper into the arms of Jesus. And I also want you to know who I am as your leader and as your pastor. I want to relieve this anxiety in all of you, church. I want to relieve this anxiety in us. I want to relieve so many things. I know that, that some may be upset and may already be upset with that, but I want you to know something about your pastor. When I'm before Jesus... When I'm up there and I've taken my last breath on earth and, and absent from the body, present with the Lord, I'm in front of Jesus. Do you know what he will ask me? He said, as the shepherd of one, two church, what did you do with the message that I gave you? What did the people hear? Did they hear fillers? Did, they, did, did you tickle their ears so that they felt better walking out? Or did you dig deep and expose the truth? And when I stand before him, I want you to know as your pastor, I fear God. I do not fear man. The, the insults can come, the, the attacks can come, but I fear God. And when I'm before God, there's gonna be no one standing with me. It's gonna be me. I haven't even gotten into my sermon yet, let's go. But it's gonna be me before Jesus. And he's gonna say, 
Well done, thy good and faithful servant, because I refuse to get caught up in the traditions of man, the religious customs. I'm a pastor, just so you know if you're new here. I'm a pastor that doesn't like religion. Why? Because it killed my Jesus. And so this is a relationship with Jesus. That's the only transforming power is a relationship with Jesus. I fear God, which means I have a deep love and respect for him. I love people, but I don't fear man. And that, that's the hill that I'm willing to die on because that's the hill that my Savior died on. And if you're here and you've been hurt by church, can I be the pastor in your life to say, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. The, the, the way that they threw condemnation and judgment and shame on you, I want you to know that is not my Jesus and that's not the Jesus that's here. So I want to let you know that I am sorry if that has happened to you. Let's, let's get into the sermon. Father, we love you. Father, I pray that this, uh, this message is yours. Lord, that, um, man, the emotions feeling now, Lord, we know it. I know it comes from you. Lord, uh, I pray Lord, that the things that are hurting us, that we can face it, we can talk about it. And Lord, that we can work through it. And we know that not everyone who's in this room has to believe the same, which that's what I love about you, Lord, that you love us when we're not okay, but you don't want us to stay there. And I pray this message, Lord, it hits home. You open the hearts and the minds of those sitting before us. Lord, I love you. Amen. You want to lighten it up a little bit? I'm going to tell you um, a story that I didn't, I don't want to tell you. It is my most embarrassing moment as, as um, a human on this earth. Okay? Most embarrassing moment. I was younger and I had a paper out. And uh, I would go to school and then I would have to, I would actually have to roll and um, put a rubber band around the papers and then I would have to walk. We lived on uh, West Third Street and my, my uh, route was the west side of town. We only had an east side and a west side Main Street or the, uh, the uh, highway or maybe it was Main Street was splitting it. And so I just had the west side all the way up to 10th. Okay, so you just go down, I would just throw the papers. And I realized as I'm rolling the papers, I may have to use the bathroom. And I thought, no, no, I'll just get through the, uh, get through the paper out and then I can use the bathroom. Now, if you're, if you're new here, you're like, man, this is, this is a wild church. The pastor's now talking about going number two. Yes, that's where I'm going with this, okay? So I am, uh, this is a true story and I wish it wasn't. Um, so I'm getting through the, uh, the paper out. I'm almost done. I have two streets left. And uh, suddenly I realize I have to go like now, like now, now, now. Um, there's people that I know on this route, teachers in the town, friends, parents. But I'm like, no, no, uh, I'll just, I'm just going to run. I'm going to take off running and I'm just going to throw papers while I'm doing it so I can get done. The only problem is once you get done, you have, I have to go back from 10th Street all the way back to 3rd Street. So I'm running and I'm running and uh, I'm throwing papers. And I was a kid. I grew up in, in a different religion and we weren't allowed to cuss. So how many of you uh, do the Christian Christian comes to me like, oh, Lord, Jesus, 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 help me right now. Jesus, help me. And I'm, I'm shouting the name of Jesus as I'm throwing these, these papers. And it is going crazy, right? So I'm throwing them. I'm missing things. One, one of them I throw and I break a, a big pottery thing that was on my principal's front porch. And I didn't even care. I had people coming out like, who is this kid who's just ran manically just running down the street Throwing papers wherever. I just needed to get this weight off of me in more ways than not. If you know what I mean? So all of a sudden it was like, no, no, this is. You ever get to that point where you, you start thinking, well, I could go there. I, I, could, I could go there. But I'd probably go to jail if I went there. That was my mindset. So I get to one of the last homes. 
And I'm frantically knocking on the door. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I'm knocking on the door, no answer. So there is uh, right out front, I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at this point. There was a, there was a little shrub <laughs> right, in the, right at the front door of the house. Yeah, that, it, it, it happened. And the bush wasn't big enough to cover me. But as it was happening, that frantic knock alerted somebody. And they opened the door and there's, there's little Matt right there. And it, it's one of those looks where you, you just look at him and you're like, I don't even care. This is happening. I got I don't, yeah. And she, love this lady. She just looks at me and said the, bless your heart, and then went inside to not embarrass me. But then I have to walk past all those people that I was frantically yelling and throwing papers and my principal's out there and I have to walk up and apologize for breaking his pot and I was not about to tell him what happened, but I think all of them knew because it was right on, right by Main Street. How, how old were you, Matt? I was 27. No, <laughs> no I was, uh, I don't know. What, what, at what age can I say where that story doesn't sound weird? I don't know, 10, 11. But you, it was bad because you have to walk by, past all those people, and they didn't know that you weren't okay, right? I was just just some kid running, and then you have to act cool when you're walking by those people that you're just friend. And I didn't have a phone at that time. Have you guys ever done this where you're like, oh, my phone's ringing. Hey, how are you doing? What's up? So you don't have to talk to that person. Couldn't do that. So I had to face all of these people, people coming at, out asking if I was okay. Why do I bring that up? <laughs> I'm not sure. No, no. Um, I think when it comes to life, every single one of us will relate to what I'm about to describe. There's going to be a day. There's going to be a season. There's going to be moments when you are just not going to be okay. Where you say, Matt, don't be negative. I'm, I'm not. I'm just trying to be a good pastor trying to help you get ahead of it in time, okay? There will be days and moments, and maybe you're in that season right now where you are not okay. And whether you are a believer or you can't stand Christians, we will all have those days. But here's the problem we are facing, church. We, meaning faith people, positive people, spiritual people, whatever you wanna call it, we concluded based on our surroundings our verbiage, our vernacular, we have learned in, in the faith, in church, we have concluded apparently it is not okay to not be okay. And you may say, Matt, I don't believe that. Well, hang around church for a bit. You've grown up in church? You've been around church for a while? In lobbies, this is what happened with ours and what happened in many others in lobbies you get around enough Christians, enough faith people, when they say, hey, how are you doing? What is the answer? Anybody? Oh, blessed. I'm, I'm blessed, brother. I'm blessed. Praise God. God is good. God is good all the time. And eventually you go, oh, so that's what we do. That's what Christians do. And when you ask them how they're doing, they're always, their answer is always doing a, a, a blessed. Doing good, lion and lamb. No, no, no one says lion and lamb, but just everything is, is fabulous in my life right now, right? Everything is good. And if we're being honest, we're famous in the world. We're famous for a number of things. But one of the things that we're famous for is that we play pretend. Because when I'm not okay, I can't say I'm not okay. My favorite, one of my favorite examples is you get in, into uh, different small groups. Now, when I'm, I'm uh, when I share this, I want you to know I'm okay. Okay, right at this moment, there are times I won't be okay, but right now I don't, I don't, I love you guys, but the, I, I can just picture in my head, you get the phone calls, Matt, are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay, um, and also I love you guys, I really do. Let's clear the air. I love you guys. 
But you get enough small groups, right? Like growing up, there was always small groups. And they always seem to be the same to me. Now we have an amazing women's group, if you, uh, women's small, that is changing the world. And I mean that literally, changing the world. If you're not involved with a small group, get a hold of my wife or, or Terry over here. Um, but you get enough small groups, and this cracks me up all the time, where you're like, let's talk about Jesus. And then you go, you say this question, how's everyone doing? And the Christians in the group, they go around the circle. That's a cue for the Christians to say, great, blessed. You know, a, a little challenge, but God's faithful. He'll see me through. Uh, you know, I lost my job, but it's not a setback. It's an opportunity for a comeback. God will work it out. God will do everything. I'll be good. And then you get to the one friend that you brought. And he looking around and he's like, well, hey, how are you doing? He's like, me? My life sucks. Like that, that's, I, I, I'm not doing good at all. That's what, that's, that's why I'm here today. Uh, okay, you know that. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> you know that. You know that story I just told. It was almost. It was almost round two. Okay. But you get that one person that is that is honest in a small group, and then you almost look at him like, who brought the new guy? Like he. he he hasn't got the memo that you really can't talk like that in church. Like you can't talk like that. We're not supposed to actually say that we're not okay. And no one wants the preacher to say they aren't okay. Right? Preacher, you, you better seek the Lord. You better make sure your spirit is right. You got to lead these people. You got to make sure you can't say that you're not okay. Just make sure that you're doing okay. There's a number of reasons we won't say we aren't okay when we aren't okay. And it's to justify in our heart and our soul, Jesus saved me from our, my sins. He died for me on the cross. He loves me. I'm going to heaven. I can't complain. I just need to change my perspective. And what we do is a little self-talk. And by the time someone comes to us and asks how we are, we say this, I'm just making it through, brother. Doing okay. I'm making it through. Another reason we won't say we aren't okay when we aren't okay is... I'm not okay, but I'm not okay for like smaller, temporary, not that big of a deal reasons. Like I have some anxiety, but I know that, that someone else has a lot more anxiety. You know, I, I got a pay cut at my job, but I know someone else in the church doesn't have a job, so I can't come out and say that this is really affecting me. This, this anxiety will pass if, we, if, if we're just quiet. And we start to judge who's allowed to be okay and who's not allowed to be not okay. And I've been in church long enough to know you better watch out who you tell when you're anxious, when you're struggling, when you have these thoughts of depression, anxiety, because they'll follow it up with, why? Why are you saying this? And you say, well, I feel this piling up in my life. You know, I had a, I had a paper due. I haven't got it done yet or you know I, I put in an offer on a house and it just fell through you better be careful who you tell that to church because when you say man I'm anxious you, you came to bring your care to God Almighty the God that died on the cross for you that rose again you came to, to bring your cares about you didn't get an off or your offer accepted on the house you better be glad that you eat you even have a house right now you better get some perspective and then we're like okay mental note don't share what you're feeling especially if it's temporary and this culture grows church it grows smart people pick on verbal pick up verbal cues from people, nonverbal cues, and everyone knows you can't really share how you're doing. Again. Furthermore, some some pastors, because the pastor isn't allowed in some in some churches and culture to ever for a moment say, Hey church, I haven't had a great week. I'm struggling. I I have so much anxiety. I'm not okay. The church will be like, we need to send that pastor on a sabbatical. We got to get someone in the pulpit that knows what they're doing, that, that is strong enough to lead these people. 
because it's not okay to not be okay. So a lot of people die in silence. They do. And growing up in church, there's, there's this thing called an unspoken prayer. Now I know a lot of that is, some of that's, I should say some of it's discretion, right? Discretion, but some is because they don't want to admit what's really going on in their life. They don't feel like they can say it out loud what's going on in their life because that's not really the way church works. But I want to ask you, what if the church could change? What if we could be a community and one, two, where it's okay to not be okay? I'm talking about strong, extraordinary people who are willing to admit at times they aren't okay. If you think about it, it doesn't make sense that we believe we are always going to be okay. It doesn't make sense. It says, don't be anxious. And then we say, you're a Christian. Don't be anxious. And we push that on others. Let's read the verse for today. I want you to look at this. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. I'm going a little further. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Picture this. He said to Peter, so he, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if, it, if this cannot pass unless I drink, I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So the first time he uh, woke one up, there's no record of waking the other two up. He woke up Peter, who is the probably the oldest, probably the only one over 21 is what they believe. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time, three prayers, crying out to God, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See the hours at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. Can we go to the very first slide? Do you know that Jesus admitted when he was not okay? Think about this for a moment. In the passage we just read, Jesus was willing to admit he was not okay. How not okay is Jesus at this, minute, at this moment? He's so not okay. He is so troubled. We make him into this robot church at times, but, but I want you to know that Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. So he was going to experience the full range of emotions that we go through, the temptations, the impulses that all of us experience. He's so not okay that three times in a row, just in case you thought the first time was an accident, three prayers asked if it's okay to escape. And one of the sure signs you're not okay is what they call escapism, church. And without knowing it, we're trying to find ways to escape. We're plotting our escape. And oftentimes it res results in self-sabotage in our own lives. Escape is a, I want you to know this, escape is a real part of dealing with pressure. You just have to escape well. You just have to escape well. But oftentimes we sabotage the things that matter to us the most because we are not okay. And here's the problem. Just like me running on my paper out, oftentimes we are unwilling to admit that we are not okay until it's almost too late. And this perpetual angst that we're unwill unwilling to deal with, it grows and it grows and it grows until you are on the edge about to make a decision that will not change God's forgiveness. It will not change his love. It, you, for those who have accepted Jesus, you will still spend eternity with him, but the consequences in this life will be real. And you'll hurt yourself and you're gonna hurt many others. 
All because at the beginning, without knowing that we create cultures in our community where someone can't come up to you and just say, hey, this sounds like a small thing, but I'm experiencing some anxiety. I'm, I'm experiencing some depression, some fear, some pain. And I've been in a dark place and I have been discouraged and I have felt like doing And immediately we want to tell people, don't be anxious, just pray more. Just be happy you have a job, happy you have a home. And without realizing that we shame people into silence. And now I'm not allowed to not be okay if it's a little thing. But maybe it's too big of a thing that you can't share. So now, we, now the only people allowed to say they aren't okay is those that fit the perfect little cliche categories in Christianity. I won't go into that, but I have perspective on it. There's a few things we're okay with in faith. And when someone says they're not okay, we say, oh, okay, but yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, we can deal with that, that makes sense. But it's amazing in other areas of people's lives when they say they aren't okay, what we say when we respond at times is you need to pray more. You need to have faith. You need to go after God. Jesus says, Father, if there's a way to not do this, that's, that's what I want. That's what I feel. I want to get out of this. Can I speak right now to those who or right here, or maybe watching online, those who uh, feel like escaping. Maybe you've been planning your escape. Maybe you've been flirting with your escape. Maybe you've been plotting the next steps of your escape. Can I urge you? Just escape the right way. Escape God's way. Jesus wants to escape. Let's go to the very first part. Jesus wants to escape. Furthermore, Jesus is not doing well. He's not okay. He wants to escape, but he's also hurt. Can you hear the hurt? The, the next slide, please. Can you hear the hurt? Coming from Jesus to those three that he entrusted, this, this, this hurt when he comes back. He, not to the twelve. Let me, let me make this clear. He brings the disciples to the garden, but he picks three and he goes further into the garden with those three. But can you hear the hurt? He asks his three closest friends. This is no longer the Messiah talking to the masses. This is a friend talking to his friends saying, I need you right now. They, they could see the pain on his face, this anxiety that he was feeling. They, he comes back from prayer and not that long. And his three closest friends are asleep. And he must have leaned down. He wakes up Peter. He's like, Peter, Peter. Peter must have wiped his eyes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't stick it out with me for one hour? For one hour you couldn't stick it out with me? I just need you for one hour. Imagine Peter. No, 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 no. Father, Savior, Savior, brother, I love you. I love you. I'm, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. And he says, Peter, if, if you're not careful, you'll falter in these moments too. Stay up with me. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll stay up. And he goes back in further into the garden to pray and he comes back and they're asleep again. This time he doesn't wake them up. How painful was that? Now, Jesus just doesn't feel the pain, he feels alone. And in a moment, he's gonna feel betrayed. Jesus, he was not okay. If Jesus was not okay, how is it that we're always okay? How is it that you can walk into churches and everyone is okay? Jesus was not okay. How is it that we are always okay? Jesus is experiencing this as an example of what we ought to do when we aren't okay. And that's what I want to leave you with today, church. There's three things that God put on my heart late last night and this morning. And I didn't get it, get it to our, our PowerPoint. So they're not up there, but you write them down. Three things, three observations, three things to do when you aren't okay. And you may say, pastor, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Like this has been a good week. Okay, here's what I want to ask you to do. Kind of fold it up and put it in your back pocket for a rainy day because those days will come. 
And you're going to need this as well. Three things to do when you're not okay. Three things you can do because these are the exact same three things that Jesus did. Number one, when you are not okay, pour it out to God. Pour it out to God. Now, I replaced the word prayer with pour because prayer at times, the word prayer is cliche and white noise for some people, right? I'll just pray for you. I'll pray for you. No, I'd like to insert pour. If you treated prayer like pouring, it would make a lot more sense to you. Pour it out to God. Is Jesus using cute words? No, he's using scandalous words, words you would never think the savior of the world would ever use. He's using escape words. He's saying, God, I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to do this. I'm in pain. It hurts. The pressure is too much. When you're not okay, pour it out to God. And let me ask you a favor. Please don't use words you think you're supposed to use. Use the words that you are feeling right here, that you're feeling in your gut, that you're feeling in your mind, and pour it out to God. Before you know it, you're going to be one of those praying people. Because you may come out of the bathroom and, and your spouse may say, man, what were you doing in the shower? I was pouring it out to God. That, that sounded like screaming and shouting in there. Exactly. Exactly. I'm pouring it out to God. Number two, what to do when you're not okay. Bear with me on this because this is a little mysterious, okay? Jesus is talking to God the Father, but he's also God the Son. So he's not only talking to the Father, he's also talking to himself. Here's what I want to say. When you're not okay, will you tell yourself the truth? Can you tell yourself the truth? Because I'll tell you what happens with me. I give people enough pretend answers that I start to believe the answers I tell people. Well, I'm good. I'm a pastor. I'm good. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm good. Everything's great. How are you? Good to see you. Praise God. Then I start telling myself, now nah, you're good. You're justifying what is going on in your mind and your, in your, in your spirit. You start to justify it. It's not a big deal. And you suppress it. But then you get a sense of I'm not okay. And before you know it, it's almost too late. When this pain, this problem, this anxiety, this issue in your life goes unchecked for so long because you won't tell yourself the truth. Matt, you're not okay. Saying that at times, it's like, oh, okay. Filter all that, that noise that I learned as a child and growing up and things I've heard, things I'm telling myself, filter that out. Are you willing to tell yourself the truth? Lastly, we ought to pour it out to God. We got to tell ourselves the truth. And here's something I've never seen before. I want to explain it to you. It seems simple and it is, but number three, can you ask your friends for help? Can you ask your friends for help? Hold on a second. Jesus shows up with 12 friends in the garden, so to speak, but only takes three further back into the garden. And I thought, oh, I know what that is because I do it too. See, sometimes I would rather text 12 different people that I'm not okay or a version of that than the three people closest to me that will ensure that I follow the course back to being okay. I would rather say, hey, pray for me. Going through some stuff, pray for me. I would rather text the pastor across the country and say, I'm in kind of one of those seasons, just pray for me, pray for me. Then go to the people that know me, that see it, will, will ensure that they see it through, that will hold me to it, that will call me, and if necessary, come find me. So when I, ask, when I say, ask your friends for help, can I say, ask the friends you're thinking about right now that God's put on your heart. Those friends right now that, that you're thinking of. Because here's what I do. I tell the people, I tell the nine people that I'm not okay just to make myself feel better, not actually to get better. Because we don't want to go through the pain of dealing with what I'm dealing with. So I say, hey, pray for me. Pray for me. And then church, I'm not asking. Everyone can't come into that pain, right? Oh, the, the other disciples, Jesus couldn't bring all of them into that. But I believe our community exists 
so that we can all have friends like this. And Matt, you say, Matt, I don't, I don't have any. That's why I want to exist so we can build you some friends like this. And I look at that story and I dream about a church that doesn't fall asleep on their friends. But I also dream about a church that functions with the transparency, transparency of Jesus. Can we go to the first slide, verse 38? Can I read this to you again? This is a grown man said this to three other grown men. This is a man. This is a definition of a man. And I want you to hear the words of Jesus. Don't get hung up on the ancient language because this is absolutely as candid as you can imagine from the Savior of the world. Here's Jesus admitting to his three closest friends, I'm not okay. My soul is so sad. I feel so sorrowful. I feel like I'm dying. Can you just stay here with me? Can you just keep a watch with me? And I look at that and I said, what if we were all willing to be that open? And what if we were the kind of friends that didn't give cliche answers or easy little answers that sound good, but don't help our friends that are hurting and are needy? I've had some tough, tough conversations this week. And all of them have been done out of love of saying, I love you so much that I'm going to tell you this that we're gonna lift you out of this. I'm not gonna come to your house or come and show up at a cafe and say, here's what I think you wanna hear. No, we don't have time for that. There are people that are hurting and there are people that are dying. I love Jesus because he didn't ask for answers. He didn't ask for an answer here. He said, will you sit here with me in my pain? Listen to that. Will you sit with me in my pain and be here with me? But how often do people like talk like that in church? How often in, in, in different small groups do you hear, I am in such a bad place. I feel like I'm dying. I just need someone to be with me here right now at this moment. I've never, I've never needed you more than I have right now. I got that text two weeks ago. I've never needed you more than I do right now. And I just called back and said, I'm here. I'm here. What do you need? Whatever you need. And I, and I let him know this means so much to me. It means so much to me when you can look at me in the face and say, I'm not okay. Can you help me in these areas? You need me here, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm checking in, I'm calling, I love you, I'll always be here for you. When did we lose that in church? You can't talk like that, Christians would rebuke you. You shouldn't be anxious, you can't be talking like that. Jesus died for you, died for you rose from the grave, and is coming back, you need to trust God more. There are some Christians that would rebuke Jesus in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where did, where, how wonky have we become at times, church? I feel like I'm dying. I feel like my life's out of control. I can't help with this. Oh, relax. Get some perspective. God loves you. Jesus died for you. So a lot of people don't come to church for help anymore. I've heard more things, more open conversations at a bar stool than I have in a church pew. Because people don't feel like they can come in and share the nitty gritty, just the dirty stuff that they're going through, that we're all going through. That's because I can't really tell them where I'm at. I dream of a church like that. And that what I love is I'm calling on this church to be the last church I pastor because this is where we're at. But I want you to know is we're only five months into this church of where I stand as a pastor. And I want you to call me on it if I deviate from anything that I've ever said. But what I love about Jesus is he had every single reason to escape. And I want to welcome Dan back up here. He had every single reason to escape and give up. Every emotional, mental, psychological reason. And he didn't give up and he changed the world. And maybe you read this and you're like me and say, Matt, I'm not like Jesus. Hold on a minute. What did we talk about a couple weeks ago? Hold on a minute. It says the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, dwells in your mortal, mortal body, life and your soul and your mind. The Bible says, greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. Wait a minute, church. This, that same Jesus that was not okay, but kept moving is the same Jesus that is now walking with you and working through you. Are you not okay? That's okay. Let me say, what? That's right, one, one two. It's not going to be one of those pretend churches that play pretend and everything's a quick fix. Some things are not a quick fix. 
And they just go on and they go on and there's a mystery and anxiety fills you and you're not okay. And I just want to be the pastor in your life that says, that's okay. Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus experienced what you're going through. Do you feel like escaping? Do you feel alone? Do you feel hurt? Do you feel betrayed? Do you feel like you're dying inside? So was Jesus. Well, we have the right man in Jesus because he's been through what you're going through. And if we're following him, we ought to be, the, be willing to let people know, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. That's okay. Come on, get over here. I want to give you a hug. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not falling asleep on you. I'm not, I'm not leaving your side. We're going to get through this. We're going to fight through this. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Just like me holding my wife when she was in tears saying, I feel like I'm dying. I say, I'm not, I'm not leaving you. I don't understand it. I don't get it, but I'm here. I'm going to be with you. I know I'm not going to leave you. There are people under the sound of my voice, whether you're watching online or here, you are not okay. And I just want to say for the record, uh, you are some kind of person because you had every reason not to be watching online and not to be sitting here today. Every single reason. You better give yourself some credit today. You are not okay, and yet you're right here listening to a Jesus talk. You're some kind of person. You shouldn't even be in the room right now because things are so bad in your life, yet you're here. What kind of courage do you have? What kind of resolve do you have? What kind of God mo movement is happening in your life? That even in your darkest hours to be watching a Jesus sermon or sitting in a bar listening to a Jesus talk. Whoa, you are someone who won't give up. No, what you're going through is hell, but you're going through it. And you're here. And that same Jesus that got through the pressure, the same Jesus that got through the pain is the same Jesus that will help you get through this season. And I mean that in no way to belittle what you're going through, church, I don't. I'm just saying you have a friend in Jesus. But I'd like to go on record to say for those who've showed up that are not okay and had every reason to escape, I believe Jesus is proud of you. I'd like to be the preacher in your life that says, I think God is proud of his people who are willing to admit they are not okay. I'm not okay. And Jesus said, I didn't come to help people who think they're totally fine. I'm like a physician. I came for broken, dying, hemorrhaging people. And God responds when we say, I'm not okay. This anxiety, I'm not okay. He responds. He's there. He cares. And I'm believing for each and every one of you going through one of these seasons, one of these moments, one of these times. I'm absolutely believing with all of my heart that the same Jesus in this garden is the same Jesus that will meet you in your pain, will meet you in your anxiety, and will meet you in these mental struggles that you're going through. I believe that, that Jesus right now is with you. And if you're not okay, church, it's okay. God loves you right there where you're at. And what's so cool about my Jesus is he loves you so much to allow you to stay in that moment. And he'll bring you out. I believe that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Father, there are moments like these where sometimes things hurt. But I, I just want us to live out your truth, Lord. Because no matter how much effort and striving we try to make in our own life, it pales in comparison to what you can do in a moment in our life of just saying yes to you, of saying yes to you. And we are able to take that pressure, that anxiety off of us and realize that you are the one that went through this so that we didn't have to carry this burden. Lord, in your word, it says that when we are weak, we are strong. Lord, I pray that we are a weak church, meaning that we are open about our weaknesses, that we meet people where they are at, not where we expect them to be. Father, help us in this journey as we grow and we continue to spread the gospel. Let it be the pure message of Jesus. No fillers, no additives, just the pure message of Jesus. 
the one that saved us. And if you're here right now under the sound of my voice or watching online, if you have not yet said yes to Jesus, I want you on the count of three to just raise your hand with all eyes closed. This is a private moment. If you're saying, I'm saying yes to Jesus, one, two, three, to Jesus, you want this. Yes, hands, 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 yes, hands, praise, yes, yes, hands, hands. Father, we love you. We thank you. And Lord, we thank you that you love us even in our moments we are not okay. That you came for those moments. You died for those moments. You rose again for those moments. Let us be a church that follows through with that, Lord, and believes that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I told you this was a group project, right? I'm not going to get weird and be like, hey, let's turn it on, make a big circle. What I want you to do is we're, we're going to end this sermon series by taking communion as a family, as a family of God. The church is also the body of Christ. And he has asked us to, to remember one thing. He says, remember me. Remember his death. Everything that he went through. And what I love about this is Removing all the fillers, okay? Jesus says, I give you two new commandments. One, love God. Two, love your neighbor as you love yourself. One, two, that'd be a cool church name, right? So love, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But you know what he ends with on all of that? Hang the law and all of the prophets. Meaning he has fulfilled all of that. Those 10 commandments fulfilled. He went... And he died for us. And he said, remember this because I'm saying it is finished. All of that. So as you come up and you just grab one of these and you can sit back, back down. I want you to be with the group that you're in. Or maybe as I was talking about the friends that you need to be with. Maybe you find that friend and you go sit with them at that table. And you partake in this communion together. So I'm going to, so we don't struggle. When you get these. This little tab, push it all the way down first to break it. And then I didn't even break it, but I'm not that strong. But push it all the way down and then up. And uh, the little wafer is on top. But I'm going to pray over this. It represents the body that was given for us and the blood that was shed for us. They said without the, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And he poured it all out, all out, so that he was the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice. So that we don't have to sacrifice all of these things anymore. We just have to say yes to him. And in this moment, you may say, I've done a lot of bad things this week. You love Jesus? Remember him. Come and, come and take this. But also be with your group, with your people, with your crew, with all those that you need. Him. Father, I pray over these elements. I pray, Lord, that you bless this bread, which represents the body that was given for us, freely given for us. Lord, you had so much anxiety and so much pain, but you said, not my will, but your will be done. And you went to that cross willingly for us. And Lord, I ask that you bless this drink, which represents the blood that was shed for us. That you spilled it all out for the forgiveness of all sins. Those who come to know you of past, present, and future sins. Lord, all of it was put on you. Let us remember that today. Amen. Amen.